Okay, well, once again, good morning. It's uh, 9 30, so I love hearing everyone catching up. What we're going to do is uh, begin our study today. There are two studies that we can come in to you as uh, your pastoral staff today. One is happening upstairs in the conference room. Pastor Dan is going through our worship life, why we do what we do, and how it relates to the Christian walk every day. Uh, I'm going to be uh, taking you through a devotional series on the Psalms during Lent. So those of you joining at home, uh, welcome. We're glad that you're joining. Can someone uh, at home please uh, give me a thumbs up that you can hear the sound, that it's working for you on the chat feature there. Which maybe it's not working if you can't hear what I'm asking you to do. Do you need Bibles? Uh, we've been doing some stuff that, uh, oh, there it is. Okay, good. Sound is working. Wonderful. Um, so for those of you at home, we're going to be doing some small group work here in the live session uh, on the church campus. And so y'all may want to make use of the chat feature to make yourselves an at-home small group so that you can uh, participate that way in the discussion of these Psalms. That's uh, how this class is kind of set up to run. And so uh, y'all can simply use the chat feature for that. Those of you who are live here uh, together in this room, uh, you're gonna be working in small groups. So you can either stay where you're at, or if you'd like to, uh, if you find your group is too small and you'd like to join a, another small group and make the group a little bit larger at a table, you may do that. Uh, but you will need your Bibles uh, for this series since it's a devotional series on the Psalms. Uh, this series is called Jesus in the Psalms. <clears throat> and what we're gonna be doing is looking for <clears throat> uh, well, I don't really wanna go into that yet. We're gonna be looking at Jesus in the Psalms though. Uh, I do want to say a quick thank you to Adrian Heiser. Uh, when she found out that I was going to do this series, Adrian has been writing personal reflections on the Psalms for many years now. And uh, she let me take a look at about 150 pages so far of, uh, of edited thoughts that she's written down on the Psalms. And I really found uh, a lot of that material very helpful. So not this week, but starting next week, uh, some of your handouts in your small groups will be copies of some of Adrian's thoughts on the Psalms, and we're going to use that as part of our uh, focus together. So can we all uh, say thank you to Adrian for sharing with the rest of us? Thank you very much. Um, so I noticed uh, a number of years ago that uh, there's kind of a way that that Christians in a North American context tend to approach the Psalms. And so uh, to show you uh, how people typically approach the Psalms versus how I'm going to be asking us to approach the Psalms in the next six weeks, we're just going to start out uh, here with Psalm 1. And so if y'all will turn to Psalm 1, very first Psalm in the book. Uh, those of you, and some of you are in here, I'm thinking of like guys like you, Rick Onan, uh, people who have gone through Psalm 1 with me, and you know the dirty, dirty preacher trick I'm about to play, don't give it away, uh, because I want to know what other people say first, okay? So, uh, take just a moment in your small groups, read through Psalm 1 together, and try to collect your thoughts on what you think the psalm means. What does it mean? How would you interpret it to someone? And go. Those of you at home, you can reflect on your own or you can use the chat feature. Thank you. 
Y'all ready to rock and roll at this table? You think so? Okay. Let me get one more little warm up. Okay, so I hear some good discussion going on in the different small groups. Uh, I wonder if we could bring it back to the large group and we could have maybe a spokesman from your little small group where you were working on things, a spokesperson from your table, uh, share with everyone uh, the kinds of takeaways that you got from Psalm 1 as you read through it as a small group. Uh, how did y'all interpret it? What do you think it means? Who wants to start? Not everyone jump at once. Okay, Sharon, going to be the brave one. Go ahead. Plunge right in. Go ahead. Uh, well, we talked about um, how that we need to stay in the word of God in that first beginning part because then you become like trees planted by the water. Okay, so her group said that you need to stay constantly in the word of God because then you become like a tree planted by streams of water. You have that, that nourishment from God's word. Is that similar to what uh, another group had as well, or is it different? Would you like to add to it? Yeah. I guess uh, we'll add to it. It was uh, in the beginning, they talk about the wicked and the, the scoffers. We kind of think like you can walk with the person, but you don't walk their path. Okay. Because you have that, that foundation. Of walk. So this table talked about, uh, if, you, if you couldn't hear it, uh, they talked about how uh, the first part opens up in the psalm talking about the wicked and the scoffers, all that stuff, and that you can walk with those people, but you don't want to walk their path. Okay. So they were trying to uh, talk about, you know, not simply shunning people you think of as sinners, but, but so, you know, walk with them, but not walk their path. In other words, not live your life the way that they live their lives. And it, 
Of course, those opening lines are absolutely delicious in Hebrew. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And I love the alliteration and the way the poetry sounds. So uh, absolutely talking about walking the path, okay? Uh, what's another group? What did you have? Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about uh, checking your, uh, your whip. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned you're trained by water. Not all trees are being treated well in water. Willow trees and gulls and things like that. So, if I have an evergreen tree by the river, it will probably die. Mm -hmm. So, you got to, well, I think what God is saying to you be careful what you plant and how you plant and how you care. Okay, so uh, for those of you at home, Elroy said that their group talked uh, in two different ways, and I shouldn't be surprised that part of it had to do with gardening. Uh, <clears throat> so their group talked uh, in two different ways. Number one was kind of like choose your friends, right? So don't walk with the, the people that you'd be running with the wrong crowd. But also they clued in on the tree by streams of water. If you plant an, uh, many different types of evergreen trees by water, they'll actually die. So uh, be careful what you plant and where you plant it, because that's what you'll get. So it's sort of a you reap what you sow kind of an idea. Okay. Okay. All right. So the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Okay. So in all of these uh, different interpretations so far, uh, who is uh, the subject of the psalm? Who, who is the psalm about? You think it's about Jesus? Okay, let me go. Let me go back to what was shared so far. Let, let's go back to what was shared so far. So we shared so far that you got to watch out not running with the wrong crowd and, and living your life the way that they do, but rather stay in the word of God and, and also be careful what you sow because you'll reap what you sow. And then also, uh, but stay in the word of God because as you stay in God's word, you become like a tree planted by streams of water. So in all of those thoughts so far on the psalm, who would be the subject of the psalm? The believer would be the subject of the psalm. So who's the believer? Us. So who is the subject of the psalm? No, make it more personal. Me. You have made yourself the subject of the psalm. Okay? Now that, that may be valid, but I'm going to... I'm going to... Pull a dirty, dirty preacher trick now. So fair, fair warning. Okay. Uh, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. How many of you have ever taken bad advice? Some, have some of you never taken bad advice? I'm really impressed if you have not. <laughs> How many of you have taken bad advice in the past and lived your life by it? Okay. And Steve's over here going, have you met my friends growing up? <laughs> uh, now, I haven't met your, your friends, uh, but I've met some of my own family members growing up, Steve. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, not my mama. My mama's a saint, and it doesn't matter that I'm biased. I'm still right. Okay. Um, but blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So if you've taken bad advice and lived your life that way, that means you have walked in the counsel of the wicked. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> nor stands in the way of sinners. So there's walking, standing, and then sitting. So there's a, there's a movement here. So there's walking along, then there's standing in the way of sinners. How many of you have found yourself as uh, one who could and should be counted with sinners? Okay. All right. 
nor sits in the seat of scoffers, so people who mock that which they do not understand. Uh, how many of you have ever found yourself as uh, mocking that which you did not understand? Okay. And if you've ever enjoyed, and I mean really enjoyed, stand-up comedy in America, you have sat with the scoffers. Because that's all American stand-up comedy is. You just point out the stupidity of people. Okay. Okay. So blessed is the man who doesn't do any of that. But we've already established that most of us in here have done all three of those. But rather... His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law, he meditates day and night. This is a room full of pious folks. Please raise your hand if you meditate on the law of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord, day and night. <laughs> Diane, Diane says she's every other day. <laughs> It's, it's like going to the gym at least three times a week, right? <laughs> but but on, on every other day, do you meditate day and night? Or is it more like 20 minutes? Maybe an hour. <laughs> 10 if I'm lucky. Okay. Surely the preacher meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, right? Yeah. Some of you have hung out with me. You know that's not the case at all. Right. Okay, so, uh, so far it says, blessed is the man who doesn't do these three things that we've all admitted that we do, but rather his delight is in the instruction of the Lord. That's the law there is bigger than like the Ten Commandments. It means the full instruction, the Torah, the full instruction of the Lord. And on his instruction, he meditates day and night. And none of us, including the preacher, can say that we meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. Are you the subject of this song? If you are, you're in trouble because you find yourself with the wrong group. Okay. So what's happened there that the first move that your groups wanted to make is that you read this psalm, and the very first thing you started doing was saying, well, I shouldn't be this kind of person, but I should be this other kind of person. What's the move you've just made? Why did you make yourself the subject of the song? Okay, it could be that you're self-centered or narcissistic, but I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna head shrink you there. Yeah, as we're talking through this, then I can see how these first three verses are actually more like instruction for us, but yet they also describe us. Okay, so I can see how these first three verses are instruction for us, but they also describe Christ. Yes. We are supposed to walk in Jesus' footsteps. Okay. Okay, so we're supposed to walk in Jesus' footsteps. So if this is about Jesus, which maybe it is, I don't know yet. We haven't gotten that far. It might not be about Jesus. It might be about some other dude. I don't know. We're not there yet. Ah, uh, y'all with your Sunday school answer. Jesus, Moses. Just keep going until one of them hits, right? Like that's, yeah, Elroy. Okay, it says law. There's no gospel yet. But again, remember, this isn't law as in the Ten Commandments. This is the full instruction of the Lord. So in that sense, it would include both law and gospel. So the word here is Torah in, in uh, Hebrew. So it would be. The Torah is both law and gospel. Yes. When you asked how would we share this with somebody, I kind of immediately thought somebody that maybe wasn't a believer yet. And so I was kind of thinking, for relating this, like, what are you living for today? What, how are you intending to live? And so with this, it knows that, you know, the law is on our mind, whether it's immediate, whether we're practicing, whether, you know, but it's something out of our, something in our peripheral that makes us feel cool. We are, we're going to try our best, like that's our DNA now, is to go right to the work, right yeah. to everything that we've been instructed upon so we can have the Holy Spirit guidance in what we do next. Right. And so I think, you know, probably speaking, if somebody is not living in any sort of intentional way, it kind of allows us to share our intention 
to introduce them to why we're not going to follow their path if you feel like that's the path of the shoppers and the criticizers and all that. So uh, those those who were here could hear Victor. Those of you at home, Victor was saying that he was thinking about how he might share this with someone else who may not be a believer. And so uh, for those of us who are believers, where do we go for Holy Spirit guidance in our life? We go back to the scriptures, and that's why you might share these scriptures with someone else to ask them, what are they living for? But I think right there, we go to the scriptures for Holy Spirit guidance, which is not wrong, by the way. That's absolutely correct. Is it correct to go to the scriptures for guidance from the Lord on how to live our lives? Yes, it is. It's correct to do that. But then since that's correct, though, uh, if we don't ever question how we're reading, what is the temptation then? It's to turn the Bible into a what? Instruction manual for life. Here's the problem. Is the Bible actually an instruction manual for life? Some of you believe that it is. Does the Bible teach you how to uh, manage your personal finances? Yes, but also what? No. Does it teach you how to balance a checkbook? No. So it's not actually an instruction manual for life. Or how about this one? Guys and gals both. Did you ever find yourself... Uh, back before you were married, uh, in the middle of a relationship where you did not exactly know how to handle this thing, but you didn't know if it was leading towards dun, 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 or we should stop wasting each other's time. Could you have gone to the Bible for instruction on what to do next? No, you couldn't. Okay. Yeah, the Bible doesn't teach you how to say, it's not you, it's me, right? <laughs> The Bible does not contain that line. It's not going to help you with that breakup, okay? Um, <laughs> does the Bible teach us to take care of the widow and the orphan? Does the Bible tell you how to do it? No. An instruction manual doesn't just tell you what to do. An instruction manual tells you the steps to go about doing it. So is the Bible an instruction manual for life? No. Is it a guide? Yes. Is it an instruction manual? No. So one of the reasons I think that we end up making these psalms about ourselves immediately is because we are used to thinking of the Bible more, instead of like a guide, like a flashlight, you know, think of a light, like a lantern or a flashlight. By this, I see everything else. So by the scriptures, I see everything else around me. Y'all with me about that? So instead of, and the Bible talks about itself that way. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? So instead of thinking of the scriptures as a light or as a guide, we end up thinking of the Bible as an instruction manual. That means that when we open up the Psalms and it says, blessed is the man who does not do all this bad stuff, but instead he sticks with God and he meditates. You think, because you're, you're pious. It's not your fault. You're pious. You love God. So you're pious. So you come to the scriptures and you go, oh, well, then I don't need to be that wicked guy. I need to be this good guy. But here's the problem. If you actually look at your life, do you look like the blessed man or do you look like the wicked? You look like the wicked. So if that's the truth and you go at the, at the Psalm 1 like it's about you and what you should be doing versus what you should not be doing, how are you going to walk away from your precious if it's every other day, right? Uh, how are you going to walk away from your precious 20 minutes that you just spent in God's word? You're going to walk away how? If it's about what you should be doing versus what you're not doing. You're going to walk away feeling guilty. You're going to walk away feeling how else? Defeated. You could be inspired. It's not going to last very long, though. Because you, you're going to be inspired for like five minutes after you walk away from your 20 minutes in scripture. Then you're going to go and you're going to, somebody's going to cut you off in traffic and you're going to yell at them and you're going to realize, oh, wait, that was, that was very quick inspiration for not a lot of pay out there. 
this is this is the problem if we make these words about immediately about us immediately about us this is the problem you're going to walk away weighted down you may not immediately feel guilty but you are going to walk away weighted down because you're going to walk away with a with a to-do list i should i should i should and I don't, and I don't, and I don't. Because really, when you when you think about it, you're like, well, I should not do these wicked things, but I should meditate on God's word. I should stay in God's word. I should, I should, I should. But then really, in the back of your head, you know the truth that you don't. So the I should always comes with a but I don't, right? You can read the Bible that way if you want to, but I do not recommend it. And here's why I do not recommend it. You will take law, Elroy, to mean the Ten Commandments instead of the full instruction, and you will start with the Ten Commandments and how you fall short and never get to the gospel. Okay? Now, let's, let's back up and say, so one of the reasons I didn't use uh, Adrian's material for this first psalm is because there's something that you have to know from the Hebrew that you don't have in your in your English translation. So that's not fair. So I'm going to give it to you with that. Asherei ha'ish asher lo halak. Okay? Blessed is the man who does not walk. The word there is ha'ish, ish, one man, singular man, the one guy. The grammar there is blessed is the one man, the one guy who does not do these things, but rather his, the one guy, his delight is in the full instruction of the Lord, and on his instruction, he meditates day and night. He, that man, is like a tree planted by streams of water, whose fruit never fails to yield. Okay? Now, do you know a guy? Like, maybe there was this one guy once <laughs> who did not take bad advice or he maybe he was numbered with the sinners one time. He was numbered with the sinners, but he didn't stand in the way of sinners. And he didn't sit with those who mock and scoff. But rather, his delight really truly was the instruction of the Lord. And on that instruction, he meditated day and night. Was there anybody that you can think of that reminds you of that guy? Jesus. Now it's Jesus. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's Jesus, but I want us to be clear as to why it's Jesus. The grammar is blessed as the one guy. I remember a, a voice, you know, we just, we're starting Lent, so that means we ended with transfiguration before we went into the season of Lent. And I seem to remember this moment where Jesus was transfigured on a mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, and there was a voice from the cloud that was the voice of the Father. And what did it say? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. In other words, this is the one guy that actually does what I tell him to do. The rest of you kids, I say it and I say it and I say it and you don't listen to me and do what I tell you to do. But this is the one son that does what I tell him to do. Yeah, James, why can't you be like your older brother Jesus? That's a lot of pressure on James, right? This is the one guy that does what I tell him to do. Listen to him, right? So this is my beloved son. So if that's Jesus, let's go to the tree metaphor now. If that's Jesus, who is the tree planted by streams of water, let's look at those verses then. What does it say about this tree planted by streams of water? Yields its fruit in season. What is the fruit of this tree? If we're keeping the metaphor, Jesus is the tree planted by streams of water. Think, I don't know, Holy Spirit, whatever you want to think. But then he, this tree, this guy yields his fruit in season. What is the fruit that this tree, who is Jesus, produces? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, so Jesus, this one time, it was like Taco Tuesday, right, Carol? And we were all eating tacos. And then this one time, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, and I have appointed you that you may go and bear much 
fruit. So it starts with us. So in a sense, who, are, who is the fruit? We are the believers, and we are appointed that we would go bear much fruit, which means we are disciples who do what? Spread the gospel, and then when people hear it, they come to Christ, so then they become the new fruit. So you are appointed that you go bear much fruit. So in other words, you are the fruit of Jesus' labor and his devotion to the Father, and then you become that which bears fruit again. So bears its fruit in season over and over and over. So if you want to find yourself in this psalm, if you start out with, oh, don't be the wicked ones, be the one blessed guy, you're going to run into trouble awfully quick because you already are the wicked. But if this one blessed guy is so blessed and he's the tree planted by streams of water, then I want to be with that guy, right? So then the question for the believer is, are you already with that guy? Who's the fruit of this tree? Make it more personal, like we did when you thought that this psalm was about you, okay? Who's the fruit of the tree? Me. I am the fruit of this tree. So if you want to find yourself in this gospel, that's a better place to find yourself. You are the fruit of this tree. Yeah, Elroy? Right. So not only does it bear its fruit in season, its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. Again, singular. In all he does, he prospers. This one guy. Okay. Therefore, look at verse five. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The wicked there and sinners, is that singular or plural? That's plural. So again, if you want to make the psalm about you from the beginning, you will find that you are actually numbered with the wicked, and that's not where you want to be. You want to be with this one guy who the metaphor for him is this tree. And if you are a believer, then you are the fruit of, of Jesus' own faith in the Father and everything he has said and done for our salvation. So you are with him. You are the fruit that comes from him. Because in everything he does, he prospers. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Is that singular or plural? Singular. The righteous one. But the way of the wicked, and that's plural, will perish. This same idea of the Lord knows the way of the righteous is the same idea that Jesus picks up on in his teaching. When you hear him say, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, or Lord, Lord open to us the door to the wedding bank with the, the party. And he says, I don't know you. Y'all remember that language? He says, I don't even know you. Why would I let you in my house? I don't know you. Where, where did you even come from? Well, you taught in our streets and you and, and, and we were around and we heard what you said. And he's like, I don't know you. Get away from me. You work, you wicked people, you workers of evil. The wicked will perish. They, they don't, they're not going to stand in the congregation. So that's the, the, the gathering of those who have been made righteous by this one blessed God. They won't stand in that congregation. In other words, they don't get to come into the big wedding feast, the big party. Okay? Now, why read the Psalms this way to where as you start out, you're immediately asking yourself, where's the Jesus in that? Okay? Uh, well, one reason to do this is uh, the following. Which book of the Bible did Jesus quote most often 
about himself. Yeah, I'm kind of begging the question because we're here on a study of Psalms. Uh, but if we weren't here on a study of Psalms, what would somebody might say? They might say Isaiah, right? Malachi, Jeremiah. But if you go back and read the Gospels, who's always quoting the prophets about Jesus? Is it Jesus? He does sometimes. Like when he, he's at the synagogue that time, you remember that? That was like a Thursday. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, it was a Saturday because it was Sabbath. Get it? Uh, so he was at synagogue and it was Saturday. And he, he said, somebody hand me the scroll of Isaiah. He read from it and then handed it back to the attendant and said, today this uh, prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. Y'all remember that? It was a Saturday? Okay. So he does quote the prophets about himself, but most of the time, who's quoting the prophets about Jesus? Is he the one doing the quoting? Or did you, or have you noticed? That may be a better question. When you're reading through the gospels, have you noticed who's actually quoting the, the prophets about Jesus? The writers of the Gospels are quoting the prophets about Jesus. So who does that mean is quoting the prophets? His own disciples, not Jesus. When Jesus quotes the Old Testament about himself, he most often uses the Psalms, which is beautiful when you think about it. Because I can say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, right? Somebody give me another opening line to a hymn. Silent night, holy night. Um, rock of ages, cleft for me, right? I could go on, abide with me, fast close the even tide, right? I mean, you know, you know your hymns. You may not always know your scriptures, but you do know the songs you grew up singing. How are they using the songs in Jesus' day? They're using it as a what? They're using it as a hymn book. Now, to be clear, most of the songs were not written as songs to begin with. Some of them were. Most of them were simply written as poems. But by the time you get to Jesus' own day, they've turned the psalms into a hymn book and they're singing them in worship. Yeah. The psalms are in the front of our worship. And the psalms are still in the front of our worship in the in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And so they're singing these. They grow up singing them. They may not all know their scriptures, but they sure know the songs they grew up singing, which happen to be the Psalms from the Old Testament. And so Jesus is quoting to the people from their worship life. It's a beautiful thing. You may be literate and be able to read the scriptures for yourself, or you may be illiterate, but whether you're literate or illiterate in his culture, you go to worship and you sing these songs. I'm going to speak to you from your worship life because that's what you know. And so he quotes the Psalms most often about himself. So if we come to the Psalms and the very first person we make it about is us, not only are you going to walk away with a bunch of, well, I should do this, but I don't, you're also going to miss the opportunity to see. Christ, your Savior, in the Psalms. And he quoted the Psalms most often about himself. It's not that the Psalm is not about you, Victor, but where you place yourself in the Psalm has to do with your belief versus unbelief. We know that the way we live most often resembles the wicked in the Psalm. But what if through belief we are actually the fruit of the one blessed man who's like a tree planted by streams of water. Now we find ourselves in a completely different place. And now how do you walk away from the song? If you know that you're the fruit of Jesus' labor, are you walking away with a list, of, with like a to-do list? No. So you're not walking away with guilt, but are you walking away with a renewed? Well, how are you walking away? You tell me. Okay, happy, blessed. Hopeful. Okay, inspired. Again, we had inspired before, but inspired a different way. What happens at five minutes after you walk away inspired and then somebody cuts you off in traffic and you want to yell at them? 
Jesus, take the wheel. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so in other words, it's not discounting the idea of asking the question, what am I living for? But the motivation for asking what I'm living for comes from a place of faith that I am the fruit produced by Jesus' labor, not that my life always reflects my own labor. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? I mean, does it make sense outside my own head? Sometimes things make sense in my head. They don't make sense to other people's heads. Yeah, Harlan? Because we're four miserable sinners, we we can't fulfill this. We can't, but there's a guy that did, and then we become the fruit of his labor. And so we start to look more like him, but not through a bunch of shoulds. It's different. It's a grace motivation. It's not a law motivation at that point. Does that hit anybody where you get your mail delivered or not? Yes, Adrian. Can we stick the word trust in there instead of the I should or I need to? Well, that's what it does to you, right? When you read it as about Jesus, suddenly you're left in a place of trust in this one blessed man that in everything he does, he prospers. So in other words, you may not be there yet, but if everything this guy does prospers, what's the outlook for your salvation? Pretty good. So I give you Luther. Luther said, when I look at myself, I don't see how there's any way in the world I can be saved. But when I look to Jesus, I don't see how there's any way in the world that I could not be saved. See the difference? So, yeah, absolutely, Adrian. It's about trust in this one blessed man. So as we go through these Psalms in this devotional way, we're going to be looking for Jesus in the Psalms. Not ourselves first, Jesus first, and then ourselves as a consequence of finding Jesus there. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? What the, what the exercise is? And next week, when we pick up on some of Adrian's devotional thoughts, we're going to show you a different way of doing this. Because sometimes the way I do things, I've noticed it's not the way other people do things. Um, so it, it may be something that you easily latch on to, or it may not be because I'm weird, okay? Uh, but Adrian has a way of going about this and finding Christ in the Psalms that I really, really like. I think it's super accessible for everyone. And so we're gonna start with some of her devotional material next time and show you how she gets to Christ in the Psalms, how she sees Jesus in the Psalms. Because there's not one way to do this, right? It doesn't have to be the way I do it. Adrian has a wonderful way of doing it. And she's been doing it for so long and written these thoughts out that I want us to see how she does it. Yeah. I was just going to say, sort of like, um, say how with your help, God, I can do this, you know, or mm -hmm. whatever it says, like, I'm treated for me in part, treated for me in part. Right. When you join the church or somebody say, will you faithfully do these things? And you're like, and, and you don't answer yes. You answer, I will with the help of God. Right. And so he is the one helping us to do those things. That's absolutely right. All right. I love you. Jesus loves you. See you next Sunday. We'll, we'll do another song together. Hey, just a straw poll. Is this fun? Okay, good. Then we'll keep doing it.